for the second day of Vesak celebrations. Professor And then the Professor Taylor will be introducing the panelists and continue the panel session. Thank you. Ta Hai Jia Xiang Wu Jie Shao. Xin Tian Da Zhe Tsan Jia Tao Lun Da Zhe Ge Zhu Jia Ren. Good morning. Good uh, morning. Good morning. Excellencies. Uh, uh, thank you very much for coming and we have a very interesting panel. The, the panel title is the Sak Peace of Heart, thinking about Buddhist heritage. And our panel is uh, going to be about the recent research in Sri Lanka. And in particular, we have two papers today. One paper about the discovery of soil, the dating of the history of the uh, archaeological research in uh, Nepal. The other one is a more complicated topic, uh, which is called Dharmapada, uh, and its contribution to the recognition of Vesak. And I am uh, moderating the session, and uh, I, I plan to have uh, this session until 10.45. Uh, 10.15, yes. and then the two speakers, the first speaker will talk about 45 minutes and the second speaker will be like 25 seconds, and then we will have questions at the end. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for coming, and there will be some questions period. So if you have any questions about to ask from the readers, even a uh, little bit uh, simple questions is all right, because we would like to explain to you archaeology and history and anthropology. Uh, uh, so uh, please write them on a the piece of paper for all your questions. <laughs> and then you <laughs> can pass them directly, you can write down on the piece of paper and then you can address them. So, and we can write them in Chinese also, that's all right, because we can ask someone to translate for us. Uh, uh, we are very happy that uh, Master Ching Kung, uh, and also Mr. Bell Doctor, who are the Dr. Chinese Guru, and these two women monks are the ones who have made this possible uh, uh, and facilitated and made possible this Chinchulina PLN organization and also Sri Narayananda International Buddhism in Sri Lanka and also some other international in, in Taiwan. And, and we are delighted to hear to see a lot of speakers from PLN organization. And thank you very much for coming. And also the uh, the acting ambassador and the staff in the Sri Lankan Commission uh, in, in Paris and the permanent delegations of the United Nations and 
also other other embassies in Macedonia and also Madagascar, and this has been part of our co-sponsorship and participating and helping us to make the site possible. We are very thankful. And also all the people who came here. And now, First of all, I will introduce our first speaker, that's uh, Professor uh, Robin Cunningham and Cunningham. And Professor Robin Cunningham's paper you can find in the book that you got yesterday. And it, will, it should be the chapter 4, I think. Uh, and we will be talking about Nepal. And Professor Cunningham is the UNESCO Chair in Archaeology at the University of UK. And he has studied archaeology and anthropology at King's College of Cambridge. And, 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 and has done a PhD and, and as a PhD scholar under Professor Lee, Professor uh, F.I. Housing. And he joined the Department of Archaeological Study at Bradford University in 1994 and became the Professor of Asian Archaeology and Head of the Department there in 2004. And then he moved to the University of Durham University in 2005 and he became the head of the department in 2008. And most importantly, probably this is the only first vice chancellor we have and he has served as a pro, uh, pro vice chancellor of faculty of social sciences and health at Durham University. And well, most interestingly, he is a fieldwork archaeologist. Field, uh, field research has been done in Bangladesh, in Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 and uh, urbanization, and Indian Ocean trade, and the of early And I did not mention here, but he has a book about Buddhism and archaeology for quite a while back, and very important work. And, and also, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, very much uh, at home in Sri Lanka, uh, and has done significant work in the ancient capital of Anuradhapura, uh, uh, and uh, 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 had done a lot of time uh, with archaeology. And also he has done work in, uh, 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 along the Silk Road in the uh, 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 Pakistan. And he has worked for over 20 years, and he has worked over 20 years in his conditions in various archaeological sites. And recently, uh, most recently, that's why actually he is here, because I was curious to know uh, his cutting in research about identifying the date of the Buddha, because there are a lot of, a lot of dispute in the last 30 years about when the Buddha lived, and we do not know when the Buddha lived, and usually it's about 700 to 500, 500 years, and last 30 years there's a lot of dispute about whether the Buddha which are lived in the century, which is called long term of the century. Some of the German scholars who have done research on the great inscription and the reference to Ashoka, now quote as well as to be later. So on the basis of the Chinese sources, the people have dated the book for the century. Now, Professor Kanemun's research kind of revisited the theory and tried to argue that actually the Sri Lankan chronology is really more accurate than the scholarly proposition, which is a very important thesis for our conference, because we are celebrating the book of the theory. So, and this most recent research is blooming, but also in the end of the last two. And it's a great pleasure to welcome the conference, and we will have a exciting conversation. Thank you very much, and I'd like to start first by by expressing my gratitude to Master Jing Fung of the Pure Land Learning College 
also so to the Venerable uh, uh, Chandler of uh, and uh, uh, Institute, uh, Venerable uh, Monks and Nuns, and excellent and ladies uh, and gentlemen. Uh, yeah. um, I was uh, delighted uh, to uh, have uh, the yeah. opportunity of joining you at Vasak, and this is the first that I have joined. And I'm also very grateful to yeah. our panel chair, yeah. Professor Mahinda, yeah. who has been extremely yeah. careful in looking yeah. after us, yeah. and also in terms of the yeah. speed of the production yeah. of the yeah. and the yeah. care and attention. Yeah. So yeah. for those of you who would yeah. like to pursue yeah. more, about the presentation so, uh, yeah. is there in black and white and also yeah, in colour yeah. in the volume. Yeah. The yeah. theme yeah. of yeah. the presentation yeah. that I'm going to make yeah. is one yeah. about yeah. education yeah. and yeah. also yeah. about yeah. research. Yeah. And it's education yeah. and research yeah. in the area yeah. of yeah. the yeah. early Buddhist yeah. past. Yeah. And the work that we've yeah. been undertaking yeah. has been in Nepal, Lumbini, yeah. uh, yeah. and the Mahadevi yeah. Temple, yeah. yeah. the Temple yeah. of the Buddha's Birth, yeah. which yeah. we've been yeah. to work yeah. here. Um, uh, but as the uh, Reverend uh, Kelly mentioned, uh, I, uh, I sort of cut uh, my archaeological uh, teeth working uh, in uh, Anuradhapura. Uh, and so uh, what uh, I would uh, like uh, to do uh, is talk to you now about uh, some uh, of uh, that uh, educational uh, uh, mission uh, that we've been following. Uh, also, I must acknowledge the work of my co-investigator, Kosh Prasadacharya, former Director General of Government of Nepal, who has been with me throughout the excavations and who has full responsibility for its findings as well. Um, before talking about the work, I feel I have to um, refer to the earthquakes of the 25th of April and also the 12th of May, because of the cultural destruction that in the Kathmandu Valley, pushing towards uh, Gurkha, is absolutely phenomenally terrible. The loss of life, the loss of livelihood is deeply worrying. But also, we have an almost complete loss of some of the cultural heritage. This is the Hanuman Doka Square. The ruins that you see uh, here, uh, this uh, was uh, actually uh, the oldest uh, uh, temple uh, in Kathmandu, uh, uh, and now it uh, is uh, just a pile of rubble. Funding uh, has come uh, in uh, to uh, assist uh, with uh, the earthquake, uh, but actually uh, in terms uh, of the reconstruction uh, of uh, living temples, uh, like uh, uh, centers uh, for uh, people's uh, rich and uh, large, uh, has uh, not uh, yet uh, yet uh, yet uh, begun. So it will be decades before the ritual, the ritual, the ritual, the culture of the man is at all rehabilitated, a tremendous loss. And many of you may think why we need any form of research for uh, an individual who is well known as Siddhartha uh, Gautama, known also as Buddha. There are hundreds of books, there are many films. Um, but actually, uh, one of the uh, elements uh, which uh, is uh, interesting uh, in uh, 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 the archaeology uh, uh, is actually uh, 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 there is uh, uh, much uh, discussion, uh, and uh, uh, as our panel chair mentioned, about uh, when he actually lived, whether it's the short uh, chronology uh, or the long uh, chronology, uh, whether he was born uh, in the seventh uh, or sixth uh, century, uh, and uh, when, uh, whether he was born uh, in the fifth uh, century. And what we have. At his passing away, at his Mahaparabha, we have the instruction given to Ananda that four places were worthy of pilgrimage. Those were Lumbini, where he was born, Gaya, where he achieved enlightenment, Sanat, where he first preached, and then finally Kushinagara, where his passing. Uh, and for those uh, sites were all uh, rediscovered uh, in the 19th century, uh, but uh, the debate uh, is there that we have uh, a long chronology uh, and a long chronology. Uh, Some archaeologists, uh, like uh, Herbert Hutton, have said that the opportunity of actually understanding more about this is almost zero. The archaeologists are so minute, the evidence of the protection that actually one does have a start to stand. 
样的 chance。很多的这个考古学家，他们都觉得可能啊没有办法，可能在这方面获得更多的知识。呃，那一些德国的考古学家也说，对于这个佛祖想要了解更多的有关他的信息，可能是不可能的。Because the period. 我们想，我们呢，现在有一些新的发现呢，确实是特别的有意义，因为呀，它在像亚特兰蒂亚，呃，还有像一些呃，这个印度的这个出现呢，建立一些王国啊，等等，这一切啊，都是啊、呃，发生在就是呃。佛祖的那个时期。因此呢，我们呢在做这方面的呃这个调查，当我们发现呢，呃当时在出现这种，当时社会出现这种大的经济社会变化的时候啊，也正是呃佛祖他出生，佛祖他在教学的时候。那我们对于佛祖的这个生活的这个调查，一般都是在十九世纪开始的，当时都是一些殖民国家的学者。啊，他们开始做一些调查。那那我们可以看到，就是我现在屏幕上打出来的这些图片呢，呃，都是呃一些我们当时找到的一些考古的迹象。那当然，除了这些呃英国的学者之外，那之前像中国历史上有玄奘啊，呃，那他们呢，在几个世纪几几几个世纪前，呃，又有相关的一些调查和。信息。那从呃中国的那些呃僧人他们的这个朝圣的这些资料里边，我们可以了解到很多有关佛祖生命的信息。那佛教的这种传播呢，是从阿富汗一直传到斯里兰卡、阿孟加拉等等国家。因此，我们在这些国家也有一定的记录。那比如说，在这个呃罗皮尼，呃，我们可以看到就是有。这样一个柱子，那这个柱子啊，那、啊、它就是从其他的一些佛教国家传来的。所有这些呢，呃，都是这种佛教传播到其他国家以后留下来的一些印记。那我在这里提到的这些地点呢，呃，就是这屏幕上打出来红色的这些点呢，不管是呃罗皮尼还是其他地方，它都是和佛祖生命中呃留下印记的一些地方。所有的这些遗迹呢，一般都是主要是由 Alexander c a n i g a n 那他是印度考古学会当时的主席，也是由他来发现的一些遗迹。那他呢，在他的生命当中是不断的发现了很多的呃这个遗迹。那呃这个罗宾尼啊，实际上是最后发现的，就是说这个佛祖出生点是呃当时的考古学会最后发现的一点。那当时在一八九六年的时候啊，呃是有一位英国的。学者和尼泊尔当时的学者，他们呃发现门的，因为他们当时是看到有一堵墙，然后呃这个墙之后，他发现有一个柱子，然后他们就清理了这一块。那去清理之后呢，他们呃就呃发现上面有一些这个刻纹，然后他们在这上面呢呃看到就是自己进行了调查之后，呃就是公元前二百多年前的呃刻下的文字，那他们从这个文字的基础上就推测出释迦牟尼。出生的时间呢是啊，公元前二百多年出生的，于是罗宾尼就被定为是佛祖出生的地方。那你们可以看到，这就是呃这个。The first excavation, which is clear, is the one that the general one was clear. 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 The one that the 边呢是有呃这个玛雅，也就是释迦牟尼他母亲的呃寺庙。
Secretary General of the UN visited Lumbini and declared what she assumed was a suitable place for world peace. And that had been taken previously here in the European Union since the European Union was founded. If they were wealthy, they could go to Lumbini. 呃，乘车去，但大多数人呢都是徒步去罗比尼，呃，进行朝圣。So the UN actually commissioned a very famous Japanese architect, Kenzo Tani, and Kenzo Tani created a huge wall measuring three miles by one mile, and it was created by the joy of a pilgrim. 我们设计了这样一个朝圣路线图。那在这个朝圣的这个点上呢，有公园，有酒店，然后在中间呢是一个寺庙，那周边呢又有呃，它有条有条有条河呢，它是白两边分开，把大乘教和小乘教分开。呃，然后呢就是在这个寺庙旁边呢有一棵树，那这个树呢是在原来的这个玛雅这个寺庙的旁边。Should be the travel from the secular. 那你们可以看到，就是从北向南，他这样走的过程中，实际上是从呃这个世俗，从呃世俗的这个点起起步，然后慢慢走向最后的这个平静。那这呢，就是当时在这个设计师他的这个理念。那在八十年代的时候呢，呃，人们意识到这棵树啊，它是在影响到这个土坡，因此。当时的这个日本的设计师，还有尼泊尼泊尔的政府啊，就决定要把这个树给它移走。对，然后呢，在这个时候，他们就发现在那里有一个长方形的呃一个建筑。那这实际上呢是阿育王的寺庙。那这个寺庙它是二十米宽，二、啊、十米长，十五米宽。那在右上边呢就可以看到，就是在呃挖掘的时候。看到的这幅图，这当时真的是让呃很多考古学家都感到非常的兴奋。那这呢就是。在两千年的时候，我们看到的呃这个寺庙的图像，因为当时啊，呃很多人都是在争论到底应该在应该怎么样在这个基础上能够再建一个寺庙。呃，因为呢，就是它周边的环境不是特别的好，它很难很多朝圣者信徒他到这以后可能会觉得有些失望，因此在两千零二年的时候就有了这种计划来建一个。呃，新的寺庙。那现在呢，每年都有呃九十五万个信徒，他们会来这个寺庙来呃修行。那么在这个寺庙呢，每年都有呃九十五万个信徒，他们会来这个寺庙来修行。那么在这个寺庙呢，每年都有呃九十五万个信徒，他们会来这个寺庙来修行。那么在这个寺庙呢，每年都有呃九十五万个信徒，他们会来这个寺庙来修行。那么在这个寺庙呢， In 2009, because this is why. 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 Because this is
had to take into consideration. The team and so during that time, we actually excavated a square space in the foundation of the Asokan Temple to try and understand was there anything below it, and also to try and understand where some water was coming from. And when we started as an archaeologist, you cut a trench, and then you look at the sequence, and this shows that when the Emperor Sinclair had built his temple, there was no meaning of it on top of the pre-existing temple. And and buried below the ground, it slowly loses that radiation. Therefore, when you re-excavate it, you can uh, make it come up to the radiation, and like, a scientific date. When we excavated, we were very surprised to find this is the Sokan temple here. You can see the foundations. We were surprised to find this Sokan temple was built. Entirely on the top of an earlier temple built in Britain, about 50 centimeters underneath 
西马的教徒他们在建这个玛雅寺庙的时候他并没有破坏之前的那个寺庙他是在这个上面去打下了地基性建这个玛雅寺庙西马的教徒他们在建这个玛雅寺庙的时候他并没有破坏之前的那个
，啊，你给的是那么多。因为呢，还有一些已经碎了的。Elsewhere within the temple, we found these very large bricks. Here you can see in French C9. Here, although here the temple floor was damaged, in C12, this is the Asokan wall here. This is a perfectly preserved piece of the pre-Asokan floor here. So the Emperor Asoka just built his temple on top. This is. The earliest brick-built Buddhist shrine that we have evidence for. In terms of the archaeological sequence in the Asokan period, we have evidence of northern black polish ware, which is a very fine tableware. It's a luxury good. It's normally associated with the spread and patronage of the Emperor Asokan. Underneath that. We found pottery marked with cords, decorated with a mat impression and cord impression. This is a very vernacular style in this area. So the early activities, the early occupation of the site, is linked to very much its own local region. And then later in the Asokan period, it becomes more of a luxury imperial center. Also, with this evidence, we can begin to reconstruct what did the early shrines look like. So, for example, here is the Emperor Soka's temple. The center is open, so the original center is open. But we found tiles in this area and in this area, not in the center, only around the edges. And this gives us an idea that actually this is purely a reconstruction. We're still working on it. But the center of the Asokan shrine was open. The roof was tiled. The walls were timber, and they used plaster. And we know that they even whitewashed. So it gives us an idea of what this Asokan temple looked like. What about the Asokan horizon? The Asokan horizon is a period of monumental construction across South Asia of brick and stone. The excavations gave us the opportunity to excavate below the Asokan horizon, what we call breaking the Asokan horizon, and we found. All over the temple in the different trenches, evidence of very large bricks. And so here you can see at the centre, it was defined by a curb, a curb of raised bricks, and the other areas, it was a pavement, a very simple but monumental brick-built shrine. And here you can see this is the recreation of it. This very large platform, and right at the centre, this open area. Again, the Emperor Soka very carefully preserved this. And what about the earlier structure? We have a series of post holes, and this is quite close to this is Downey, quite close to Lumbini. This is a very simple shrine, a village shrine, with a tank and a tree and a railing around it. And so the earliest reconstruction we have of this structure is a very simple timber fence around a sacred space. Which is then replicated in brick, and then later by the Asoka. Now, what does this evidence show us? This evidence favours the long chronology. I used to be very keen on the short chronology because there was no archaeological evidence between the life of the Emperor Asoka and the earlier layers. Almost nothing. Lumbini has given us this amazing opportunity, this privileged opportunity, of actually seeing the development of Buddhist architecture in its very earliest years and favors the long chronology. This early structure dates to the 6th century BC, which favors the long chronology. In a way, we were very puzzled by the central space. Why was the center of the temple open? 
We undertook scientific analysis. We took a series of microscopic slides from the site. This is looked at under a microscope. And what we found was fossilized root, mineralized roots of trees. The reason the central portion of the shrine was open was because it was built around a tree. Now, in a way, this should be no surprise for those of you who know Sri Lanka well. You know, Sri Mahabodhi is a game of shrine built around the tree. Bodhi Gaya was originally a shrine built around the tree. The, the very famous Sri Lankan film, Bostika Coins, here you can see a little tree with uh, an enclosure. And even at Bahut, some of the earliest uh, depictions of Buddhist architecture have tree shrines. We should not be surprised to find at the center of this structure, we should not be surprised to find a tree. And of course, it's one of those very rare moments when tradition, archaeological science come together to actually uh, link with the Buddhist traditions of Mahabodhi. Using the archaeological science, we are also now on the verge of identifying which species of tree, because here are the three main contenders, Ficus religiosa, Ahsoka and also the Each of these have different acids and fats within the tree leaves. When those decay in the soil, they leave the fats. The fats will not degrade. So by analyzing the soil and looking at the types of fatty signatures, you can actually even identify the species of the tree that grew there. So we hope within the next six months to actually have identified which tree was growing in the shrine. In addition to the work within the Maya Devi Temple, we also work in the ancient monastic area to the south of the Maya Devi Temple. And there we found evidence of monasteries. Underneath them we found evidence of timber structures. And we even found evidence of early monastic practice, this is an So we even found a beautifully preserved example of the arms bowl of a woman or a nun from the site. And also, no animal bone and no manufacture within the area of the monastery. This is the village mound. If you remember, the Asokan Edict mentions Lumbini Game, the village of Lumbini. And currently, there is a mound about 200 meters away from the Maya Devi Shrine, which has a police station on top. This is built on top of an archaeological site. In the parade ground, we put an excavation trench four meters deep and we found evidence that this village had been occupied by 1,300 BC. So Lumbini was not afraid before the birth of or the life of the Buddha, but actually it was already a well-established village, the village of Lumbini. And we have evidence of its manufacturing, of its diet, and in the later years it even produces oil lamps for the pilgrims visiting the Maya now, I talked about Lumbini, but there is an equally important site that I've been working on with my Nepali colleagues called Tillerakot. And Tillerakot is identified as ancient Kapilavastu. So the Buddha was born in Lumbini, but then his childhood home until the age of 29 was the ancient city of Kapilavastu. This is Tillerakot when you visit. It's a mound, it's covered in grass, it has trees. For the pilgrim, it's very disappointing. Tillerakot was identified at the same time as Lumbini by P.C. Mukherjee, an archaeologist, using the travel descriptions of Farsang and Wanzang, the Chinese pilgrims. 
who said it is such and such a distance, such and such a direction from Shravasti to Kapilavastu to Lumbini. So this is how it was originally discovered. It was then excavated in the 1960s by Deb Lamitra, who said it was not old enough to be ancient Kapilavastu. Uh, it was then excavated by teams from the government of Nepal and a Japanese university who began to identify its western gate, its eastern gate, and a large building. And then over the last year, with funds from the Japanese Funds in Trust for UNESCO, who generously support our work, with the support of the Lumbini Development Trust and the government of Nepal and my own university, Durham, we started a new project at Turoko Kaplavastu. We've been doing mapping, this is an electronic distance meter, and this is a drone. The drone is wonderful, it goes up to a height of about 300 meters and it maps uh, the topography. So this is a plan of the ancient city, it measures about uh, 400 meters by about 600 meters and you can see it's rectangular, here there are rivers, so we're doing topographic mapping. We also have been using geophysical survey, this is a magnetometer. You take one reading every 50 centimeters and it measures how magnetic the ground is. If you have a wall of bricks under the surface, it is very magnetic. If you have mud, it is not magnetic. Using this, downloading it onto a computer, you get the most beautiful plans. Literally, you are seeing beneath the surface. So these areas are all the areas we are surveying, because here is a picture from the Atisastra, which suggests the city is not just defined by walls, but also by the monasteries and the settlements around it. This is a survey of the city of Kapilavastu, and you can see, without excavation, we know there are roads, street map, and right at the center this year we discovered a walled palace So this is so exciting. This is just new in February, and next year in January we have permission with the UNESCO team to start excavating in the palace at Kapilavastu. Inside the city we have evidence of beautifully built rectangular and square houses, we also have evidence of roadways, this is one of the roadways, and you can see it leads to the Eastern Gate, which is the Gate of Renunciation. And also we have civic architecture. In the center of the city, measuring 40 meters by 40 meters, here, we have found a huge pond, a brick line pond, at the center of the city. This is civic investment, rather like the, the ponds of the Kathmandu Valley. And also we are doing deep excavations because the levels on the surface go to the Kushana period, but down at the bottom are the timber structures that date to the lifetime of the Buddha. And this gives you some of the idea. Here we have very early timber structures, and here we have structures in the 7th century AD, so we have a very deep sequence. And we even found evidence of the early fortification walls of the city, which were built in timber, before later being built in brick. And most exciting, outside the eastern gate, there is a stupa, and this is the point of renunciation. This is where, at the age of 29, the Buddha left his family, his princely life. Under the fields, you just see, on top of the fields, you just see grass. Here is the geophysical survey. What you see here is an enormous monastery measuring 500 meters by 300 meters. It has viharas, it has shrines, it also has parents.
So we excavated here, we bought the fields of Dal, put in excavations, and we were very excited whilst excavating one of the Vihars to find 498 silver coins, pump mark coins, of the period of the Empire Seca. This is a very, very important shrine, previously unknown. To the south of the city, we found a huge industrial complex outside the city walls. So the ancient city was well planned, polluting industry was outside the city. And so we begin to understand there is a central palace, there is a monastery outside the uh, east, a monastery outside the north, uh, we think a monastery outside the west, an industrial area in the south, and this palace area right at the central city. When you look at what our work has identified, it's very, very similar to the description of the ancient city by the Chinese pilgrim Fa Sen. Very, very similar. Same um, our project continues, but of course this work does not mean the significance of the Lumbini to pilgrims has changed in any way. Still, it is significant. And as I mentioned, it's significant for Theravada, for Mahayana, and also for Hindus living in that vicinity. It also has an economic significance, because this is one of the poorest areas of Nepal. Very low literacy, very high child mortality, very high unemployment. What is significant? Uh, We've been studying the movements of pilgrims. Uh, Most pilgrims spend less than 30 minutes in the sacred garden. Most of them come over the Indian border in an Indian bus. They bring their Indian packed lunch. They visit the site. They just leave rubbish. There is no social or economic benefit to those stakeholders and communities in the area. So we've been working with the stakeholders, with Buddhist communities, to actually begin to try and enhance the visitor and pilgrim experience, creating new pathways and areas to pray so that religious and ritual activities can undergo, but without damaging the archaeology of the site. And we've been creating these risk maps. Red means do not excavate, do not put water or power lines, green means these are the sensible places to put them. We've also been training officers from the University of Tribhuvan uh, uh, University, the Department of Archaeology, Lumbini Development Trust, and we've had observers. This is the new director general of the Sri Lankan Cultural Triangle, mm, Professor Kunwarta, visiting us, uh, and we've taken uh, officers to the UK because we believe that actually we can enhance the pilgrim experience and also benefit financially and economically and socially the local communities. This is to cope with pilgrims from Taiwan and we are also creating uh, signs so there's more information and also the government of Nepal is investing in museums to offer places to sell handicrafts, guiding tour guides are also being trained from local villages and stakeholders who are already beginning to benefit from those communities. And also, many of the monuments that we've discovered are outside government control. So, for example, a portion of the new monastery we've discovered outside the eastern gate of Kavastu was destroyed. So, completely destroyed. We have now given recommendations to the government of Nepal to protect and purchase this area because all of this area is under threat from development, unplanned development. Development is good, unplanned development is not good. The potential for this region, the native landscape of the Buddha, because of course this is not just the Sakyamuni Buddha's birthplace, this is also the birthplace of two other former Buddhas.
So this So looking together at the challenges, looking together at the solutions, we can begin to understand better how to reach this concept of sustainable pilgrimage. Finally, I have many, many colleagues uh, in the published version who I have thanked, including our own very uh, kind chair, um, and I am deeply grateful to the stakeholders, to the Lumini Development Trust, to UNESCO, and also to the Japanese Housing Trust for supporting this work, which, as I hope I've demonstrated, is not just research, is educational, and also may have an impact on changing people's lives and improving the social and economic environment in those areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Professor Cunningham. And Professor Cunningham made his speech very accessible to all of us who are trying to scientific analysis. What is interesting is that as Professor Cunningham said that uh, 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 and if you have any questions for Professor Cunningham, please write them down on a piece of paper. And we still have time a little bit later after Professor Kempo, and we will discuss it. And any questions you ever have? Now, uh, I now I move to introduce our second speaker, uh, Professor Stephen Kempo. Uh, Professor Stephen Kempo is a child of the Dunner, Professor of Anthropology in Bates College, Maine, U.S., United States. And we know his work, uh, very important work, actually quite related with Professor Kahneman's work. Uh, his, uh, his book is called The Presence of the Past, Kahneman's Politics uh, and How Changes in Life, actually, concerned about Mahavansa. Uh, and much more uh, how the Mahavansa is national thinking, nationalism. And ethnic issue and things like that. And then he has other works. One is called Binary Living Sri Lankan Advertising and Consumers in Transnational World. And that's his Pair House and One from the University of Chicago Press. And why he is here today is a personal reason. Because if you, if you think about Sri Lanka, late 19th century and the 20th century, 
Not only Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka India. As Buddhists, we cannot be proud without Dharma Pala. Anagarika Dharma Pala. Because without him, we will not be able to sum up. Of course, there are negative side, but positive side is in the Mahabodhi society. And we seem to have very active agenda to Buddha Gaya and Sarana and other places. And also he is a reformer in Sri Lanka. And I think this was one of the fiftieth anniversaries this year. And Professor Kemper has produced the groundbreaking work on Anagarika Dharma Pala. Nobody else has done it. So his new book is called Dharma Pala. Uh, rescued from nation, Anagarika Dharma Pala, and the Buddhist world. You know, just came out uh, uh, two, three months ago from the University of Chicago Press. I recommend everybody read it. And, and, and that's a very groundbreaking work. And as a Sri Lankan, we should be very proud. Because it's also very related to our topic because we are celebrating United Nations recognition of this this birthday as an international holiday. And actually, the unsaid story, the story not because not is it was Anagarika Dharma Pala who is the one actually the first initiator, initiator of that process, you know, making affirmative and emphasizing that we have to protect the Buddhist place, we have to protect the Buddhist enlightened place, we have to protect the Buddhist uh, place where he passed away and so on. And, and so Anagarika Dharma Pala did a lot. And so Professor Kemper comes to me and says that actually Dharma Pala was not only a nationalist or some racist, but actually he was a missionary. He was a missionary to take Buddhism away and also to Vesak. So with that note, I will come to this here. Steve Kemper will tell us about Dharma Pala. 我们请坎贝尔教授来给我们介绍这一点。阿布斯瓦，阿布安，纳马斯特，你好，你好，你好，斯瓦姆莱克姆，斯罗姆，哈喽，哈喽，欧拉，我将尝试去捕捉。I'm going to try to pick up uh, where Professor Cunningham left us, um, but less skillfully because I don't have a PowerPoint, so you're going to have to bear with me, and I will try to keep this as uh, clear-headed as I possibly can and I'll simply talk about uh, Anagar Dhammapala's extraordinary career. I, I think the takeaway from uh, my talk this morning uh, is the idea that Vesak is a product of many hands. Uh, Dhammapala certainly is uh, a, a central figure, and an American Civil War officer, Henry Steele Olcott, is an important figure as well. But if you think about this holiday, uh, this celebration, it has remarkable qualities of bringing the inside together with the outside. Buddhists with people who are not Buddhists. Uh, it has the quality of bringing Europeans together with uh, ethnic Buddhists from Asia. It has the quality of bringing people of religious faith together with people who are simply impressed uh, with the human qualities of the Buddha. And uh, what I'd like to make the focus of my remarks is the, the uh, process by which those various forces are brought together. If you know the name of Dharmapala, Anagarika Dharmapala at least, uh, you probably know her in reference to her struggle to regain control of Bodh Gaya. He uh, made his first trip to Bodh Gaya in 1891. Uh, he traveled from Sri Lanka uh, by train to Bombay and he actually visited Sarnath first. So he arrived in 1891 and moved to found that uh, the sacred place was in possession 
of Hindu world renouncers. They were Shaivites. They had a monastery on the edge of the Mahabodhi compound, and they had been there from the 1620s. They had a deed from the Mughal emperor from the 1720s, and uh, they were in complete legal possession of uh, a Buddhist place. It was an auspicious place, and one of the characteristics, I think, of South Asian religiosity is that auspicious places are auspicious, uh, independent of the particular figure who lives there. So Sufi shrines get visited by people who are Hindus or Christians or uh, Buddhists, and likewise Buddhist places get visited by people who are Hindus. Dhammapala wanted Gaya for obvious reasons to be a, a Buddhist place, and there was uh, uh, no particular respect to the Lord Buddha at Gaya, and he launched the struggle to try to regain control of the place. He's known in Sri Lanka as the person who revived uh, the the Buddhist religion and Singhala ethnic pride. He, he, he was himself Singhala, the dominant ethnic group in Sri Lanka, um, uh, raised in a Buddhist family, but educated in Colombo at a series of missionary schools. And he had a very negative experience in those missionary schools. He learned, he learned uh, wonderful English. Uh, he learned uh, the Bible, uh, but he had an, uh, uh, a harsh reaction to the fact that the typically Catholic fathers, he didn't go to Protestant schools, he went to Catholic schools by and large. Catholic fathers required him to pray several times during the day, and obviously that was hard for him to bear. So uh, he, he plays a reformative role in Sri Lanka. He also becomes a missionary and carries Buddhism to India. He sets up housekeeping in Calcutta uh, in the 1890s, and he spends he spends uh, 80 to 90 percent of his adult life living not in Sri Lanka but living either in India or Japan or London. He, he was a world traveler and he was always on wing. He was going here and there on uh, his attempt to make Buddhism present in the world. He was a missionary, but he was a very peculiar sort of missionary. He had no interest in converting people. And that resistance to converting people was a reaction to his experience in those uh, missionary schools that he was educated at. So in the course of his lifetime, he, he, he is identified with the conversion of two Westerners. Um, he, he didn't really uh, propagandize them or uh, uh, even convert them because he wasn't a Buddhist monk, and he was not entitled to convert people. But uh, uh, many people in the, early, in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, who became Buddhist did so by uh, their own self-conversion, not, not by the intervention of the, uh, the Mahasangha, but by, by way of uh, uh, change of self-description. That's the case with Henry Steele Holcott, and he's the second figure. I need to talk about before I uh, get myself launched here. Olcott was a man who served in the Army of the Potomac, fighting in the American Civil War in the 1860s. But uh, by the 1870s, uh, he had become a theosophist. Uh, theosophy, if you are not aware of this, uh, uh, Western religion was the... Uh, the master work of a woman who was a Russian aristocrat, her name was Helena Petrovich Blavatsky, and she and uh, Olcott, who became the administrative force in the Theosophical Society, started a movement uh, 
She started in Europe and first, uh, and then she moved to New York, and Olcott joined her in New York. And then they uh, became interested in the wisdom of Eastern religions, and in Buddhism in particular. L later theosophists like Annie Besant were much more interested in Hinduism, uh, but Olcott and Blavatsky were... Uh, in favor of, of Buddhism as being the summation of all Asian uh, religions. And they traveled to Sri Lanka in 1880. They arrived at Gaul. They took uh, the triple refugees. And they, um, they, they uh, had several visits to Sri Lanka. Bovatsky passes out of the scene. Olcott becomes the, the great spokesman for Buddhism, and uh, a man who is an American, but an uh, American Buddhist, and he, he organizes things in Sri Lanka so that the Buddhists can fight back against the Christians. He, he, uh, establishes a printing press he buys a Christian a missionary printing press rehabilitates it and puts it to Buddhist use he has fancy bazaars he has periodicals and he is assisted in this work by Dharmapala who uh, is a young boy at, at the time that Olcott arrives Olcott is in his middle 40s and Dharmapala is 16 so the two of them go out to a, a, a variety of single villages and they preach Buddhism. Uh, Olcott preaches and Dharmapala translates. They travel by bullock cart. They sleep at night in the bullock cart. They go from village to village. And that becomes the pattern of uh, uh, both of their missionary work. But eventually uh, Olcott uh, retires and Dharmapala takes over the, the, the charge. In 1884, uh, Olcott, who uh, had close relationships with the, with the British government, uh, convinced the, the, the governor of Ceylon that Nassau um, ought to be a national holiday, a public holiday, celebrated the same way Christmas was so enthusiastically celebrated in Sri Lanka. Uh, and that's the beginning of this uh, uh, rejoining of uh, the celebration uh, to the public sphere and to the, the colonial government. Uh, this act starts out in, in uh, ancient Anuradhapura in, in a very different form. It is an auspicious time. It is the full moon day of the month of Vesaka, uh, the second month of the, the Indian calendar. And it's a time you know, when Devanand Pietas was consecrated. It's the time when the foundation was stone for the Mahatupa what was laid. It was a time when later kings of uh, Sri Lanka would uh, offer robes to the monkhood or would offer acts of charity to the poor. So it's not exactly a birthday. It is an auspicious day, but under colonial circumstances, uh, the Western practice of, of celebrating birthdays is joined to the South Asian practice of celebrating auspicious times taking action on auspicious times. And modern Vesak is a combination of those two things working at the same time. Dharmapala carried Vesak to India with him and he celebrated the first Vesak in 1896. So in Calcutta in 1896, Dharmapala, who had been there for a number of years, got his supporters together and they celebrated Vesak. His supporters were the Bengali Badralok, that is, the well-to-do, uh, high-caste members of the local elite. They were Bengali by ethnicity and they were Hindu by way of religion, but they took part in that first Vesak ceremony. I, I, in some ways because they were theosophists. So the, the connecting link between 
这个是非常有名的一个人 I mentioned Sen, who's uh, less centrally involved than than Olcott, uh, because that first Vesak was celebrated for a, a whole set of reasons that uh, were not particularly religious. They had to do with uh, seizing upon the figure of the Buddha as a symbol of Indian national identity because uh, from the 1890s onwards uh, forward-thinking people in South Asia began to suspect that there was going to be an end to the British Raj there was going to be a time when uh, there would be an Indian nation and it was going to put in place the national feelings and the Buddha was an instrument instilling Indonesia的这种呃印度的这种属于本能的民族的一些人物，呃，从而来加强这种民族的情感，可以说它不一定完全是出于这种佛教的这种呃理念来建立出来，来建立出来，来建立出来，来建立出来，来建立出来，来建
teaching Buddhism as a tool for spiritual regeneration was Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda and Dhammapala had met in Chicago at the World Congress of Religions in 1893. Vivekananda stayed on in the United States and Dhammapala moved on to India. So Dhammapala carried the Buddhist cross forward in Calcutta. And dated that decline, like Vivekananda, dated that decline, to the period when Buddhism was disappearing from India. Forward-thinking progressive figures in the intellectual life saw the religion as the religion that could restore a kind of national pride and make connections between India and the world beyond. Vivekananda always believed that the the Vedas were the summation of human wisdom, but he saw the Buddha as the historical embodiment of that wisdom. He, he would have regarded the Buddha as a Hindu. He would have regarded uh, the Buddha not as the founder of a new religion. That was the great mistake, according to Vivekananda, that the Buddhists got into the business of uh, uh, separating their religion from Hinduism, and uh, the consequence uh, for Indian life was a wall of custom got built around India, shedding off all interaction between India and the larger Buddhist world that surrounded India on several sides, and Indus decline was a product of that closing in of Indian sensibilities. Vivekananda saw Indus regeneration as a matter of recognizing the virtues of the Buddha, which he understood as a Hindu. Not a, not I want to go on to the, the celebration of Vesak uh, in other parts of the world, but I'll just mention in passing that the Dharmapala celebrated Vesak in, in Japan in 1902. He, Dharmapala traveled around the world four or five times, depending on how you count some of those trips. Uh, he visited Japan four times, and he um, he had a he had a group of of, of members of the Mahabodhi Society in Japan who supported the cause, uh, but they were really much more interested in supporting Mahayana Buddhism and Dharmapala's own brand of Buddhism. But in, in 1902, he celebrated Vesak in Tokyo, and shortly after there were Vesak ceremonies in Lahore, which was a partially Hindu city at that time, in Chennai, in Kusanagura, in Lumbini, in a place where he celebrated Buddha's birthday, and by the early 20th century, there were Vesak ceremonies being celebrated in London. I move on to London as my second case in point and talk about um, the motivations and the, um, the, the many hands, the, the many minds part of the early celebration of Vesak in a Western country. Dharmapala was the, the first Buddhist missionary in the modern period. Uh, I, I've already said he was a, a, an unusual kind of missionary, but he wanted to make Buddhism present in the West. But there were other Buddhists who were already at the cause. There, there was a, a British soldier who, I think, by the first, first decade of the 
in England, now uh, there were English Buddhists that uh, formed the Buddhist society, and they began to celebrate Pesach. That Buddhist society regarded itself as a secular organization, that it was not a religious organization, and the people were not themselves necessarily Buddhists, they were people who were interested in Buddhism. They were scholars, scholars they were Carolinas, they were Buddhist Society of London celebrated Vesak, uh, and the president of the Buddhist Society said, this is not a celebration of the Buddha's birthday, this is just an appreciation of the Buddha. So it's not entirely clear why he would be resistant to the idea of celebrating the birthday of the Buddha, but to recognize that Vesak is going in the West, um, by way of Westerners who bring their own interests to the encounter and who understand it in, in ways that would be recognizable in many parts of Asia. Dharma Paul arrived in the UK for an extended stay in 1925 比如说有一些大使啊有一些其他的一些国际的人士有一些呃社会在伦敦生活的比较好的有钱的斯里兰卡人斯里兰卡人也是支持所有的一些人他们不一定就是说是一些印度的一些女士比如说印度的一些女士
重视他们的企业家，是因为因此之后，呃，对，卢少杰他的财力也是变得更加的丰富了。那我现在啊，再回来说一下，为什么在二十年代，呃，在伦敦的卢少杰的建筑，为什么会又让不同的来自不同社会背景的人士，不仅仅是佛教信徒能够来庆祝呃佛祖呢？因为呢，呃，本身佛教啊，它是一个非常有包容性的、普世的。一种呃全宇宙性的呃一种啊哲学，而呃佛祖他本人也是这样，他是一个属于全宇宙的人，但他呢，他他实际上能够，他是从这个社会科学的社会学的角度来说，他能够。站在别人的角度，从那些人的角度去看世界，它是有着一种非常广阔的世界观。呃，因此啊，呃，佛祖他本人呢是一种非常客观的、非常中立的人士，因此佛祖他能够吸引来自于任何一个背景的人。这就是为什么，不管你信什么样的宗教，你去。呃，执行什么样的？呃，就像你都可以被佛祖吸引，被佛教给吸引。那这样。第二个原因呢，就说这么多人，不管他是信什么宗教，来自如何生活背景，都能够庆祝维赛节的。第二个重要的原因，可能是因为。Celebrations that were in the background when Olcott and Dharmapala did their work in Sri Lanka and beyond. Olcott had in mind in 1884 that he was going to celebrate the Dharma Day in Sri Lanka. Olcott had in mind in 1884 that he was going to celebrate the Dharma Day in Sri Lanka. Olcott had in mind in 1884 that he was going to celebrate the Dharma Day in Sri Lanka. Olcott had in mind in 1884 that he was going to celebrate the Dharma Day in Sri Lanka. Olcott had in mind in 1884 that he was going to celebrate the Dharma Day in Sri Lanka. To Christmas, that is, it would give the Buddhists some public visibility. It would give them recognition that was woefully absent before 1884. That the religion of the majority community was a religion that didn't count in Colombo, and that the hegemony of Christians who were British or who were well-to-do Sri Lankans made it very difficult to. Count yourself as a serious person in Colombo uh, as late as the 1890s. So, uh, uh, Olcott's innovation was simply to uh, bring Buddhism to the public sphere. And Dharmapala carried that out when he brought it to India. Uh, he saw the shock as an occasion for, for making the uh, Buddhism. 一利用这个威赛节啊，让让佛教重新回到人们的视野当中。因为在之前的七个世纪，佛教在印度可以说几乎是属于一种消失的状态、衰落的状态。呃，于是呢，呃。达摩波罗他在庆祝维赛节的时候，实际上是呃，总是有一种这种基督教在背后的呃这种影响力，或是他利用呃基督教的一些传统的庆祝，比如说他们复活节的这种庆祝这个时段来庆祝维赛节。那么基督教徒在复活节的时候呢？呃，他们呢要呃重新的来经历呃基督，呃受难的这个经历，他的这个十二个。呃，时段呃，有这样的时段，呃，但是呢，这个维赛节它并不是要要重新的来经历呃，但呃，这个佛祖他的诞他的出生要重新经历呃，要体会他的这个事实，并不是这样，它只是一种庆祝。呃，因此从某种角度来说呢，呃，这种南无波罗蜜多佛的这个庆祝啊。呃，好像是更加的简易，更加的让人们让人们能够更好的理解彼此彼此基督教的这种阐释，这就是为什么很多人就很轻易的接受了，很容易的接受了维赛节的庆祝。呃，谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢看到博士。您刚才的发言非常重要。谢谢
uh, in all, all, all continents except Africa. Uh, and uh, now we have what a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And we have a few minutes for questions. The procedure is if you have written down questions, you can raise your hands or pass the questions to that lady on the, on, on the corridor there at the end. Or there should be a microphone there. But if there is anybody, anybody has any questions, please come forward and we will provide you a microphone. Okay, uh, that gentleman there on the right hand side is please. Huh? 的真实含义是一个很重要的问题我想请教一下这个子弟如来是谁在哪里谢谢 Someone needs to translate it into English 请翻译给我。啊，is uh, can someone please translate that? 如来，他要问如来的意思。啊，等一下，有了。嗯，good good morning. Um, he wanted to ask the true meaning of Buddha. And actually, the, the translation, the Chinese translation of Buddha is Rulai, sounds like this, yeah. So we want to know the meaning of Rulai or the Buddha. I think it is, it is, it is not for the panel, but usually Buddha means it comes from the Sanskrit root Buddha. So the Buddha is a, just an attribute, it's not a real name, because he got Satori or enlightenment or Buddhahood or because he awakened himself or he became wiser or he found wisdom. Uh, so because of that, that root called Buddha to, to know, uh, so he's called awakened one. So the Buddha is a attribute, he's not real name. His real name is Siddhartha, which is means uh, the one who has accomplished his thing. Siddhartha, Siddha means accomplished, Artha means meaning. So uh, real life, maybe the, uh, the same meaning, I don't know what the name means, but maybe the king of the Lord, maybe probably. I don't know, but, but I think it's not for the panel, but any question about Lumbini or Dharmatala, welcome. Yes, please. Can you, are you speaking in Chinese or English? Uh, that, that microphone works, that microphone works, yeah. Uh, uh, I think I can speak in English. My question is to Professor Lorin um, Cunningham. Um, professor, I'm also coming from Durham University, and uh, my major is in, in Intercultural Studies and the Chinese Language and English. Um, my, I'm very pleased to um, listen to your speech about uh, um, through the archaeological uh, evidence to um, decode or find out the, um, the birth of the Buddha. Uh, my question is about, you, I know you have lots of research um, in this area in South Asia. Um, I wonder if you have any plan or further project about, uh, you know, um, extend your research into Southeast Asia, into the Silk Road, which, you know, have uh, 
large cultural exchange between China and Western countries. And also, this is uh, we have the, the my, my view is that the way we recognize archaeology needs to, to change because for many years archaeology was a rather restrictive role of just clearing buildings, presenting and not moving forward. As last year in Rumbini, there was an international Buddhist conference supported by the Theravada Academy of Nepal and also an academy in Myanmar. And a series of resolutions as often you but these were fascinating because they, they hold the resolutions that pilgrims have a social and economic responsibility to the communities around them, Buddhists and but also that uh, scientists have a responsibility to translate their work into more accessible language, um, thirdly, that actually we need to, in a way, recast and we interpret what we mean by the archaeology of Buddhism because specialists and non-specialists, lay and, uh, and scientists and religious need to come together in that sort of very rare event. That's one of the few events. So in terms of the program of work, um, I, I have some hope that uh, the UNESCO chair will now give us the framework and we were only awarded the UNESCO chair in November. So, and I vote just to speak from being a pro-vice chancellor. So my hope is, actually, we will begin to first work within SARC. So we have very close links with the postgraduate institute of archaeology, University of Colonia in Sri Lanka, MS University in Baroda, uh, Hazara University in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and so what we're hoping to do is to create these, what I would call field laboratories to offer a training program, exchanges, observers. Um, my, my own academic framework, I have a barrier um, intellectually the moment I cross into the Bay of Bengal. So I realize that I am very interested in the transmission of ideas, Indian Ocean trade, and the uh, Hindu belief, Buddhist belief. I, I believe that actually these new scientific technologies can transform the way we understand the sites. And Buddhist pilgrimage, social development bank, is predicting there will be 22 million pilgrims in South Asia in six years annual visits. The sites as they are will be overwhelmed, which is why I would say the top priority is to try to protect and to preserve and to present correctly the 
的一个受到破坏、威胁的呃一个地下的呃考古遗址进行考察，因为人们现在呢保护的只是已经发掘的这部分，但是不知道就地底下还有什么东西，所以呢应该是对地下的那些这个呃文化的遗产呢也进行保护，甚至呢这一点对于这个。呃，已经发掘出来的这些遗址的保护呢，更为重要，因为这个对他们的保护呢，能够进一步的让人们对佛教有所呃理理了解。如果有新的这个方面，或者是人呢愿意参加我们的这些呃项目呢，我非常高兴，因为我认为在未来的几年，对于保护。这长期啊，对这些遗址啊进行保护是关键的时期。如果再不、啊、做努力来这个保护这些遗址的话，那有可能呢这些遗址就被彻底破坏了。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。谢谢。是第一节的会议啊，已经结束了。嗯，部长呢也来了，那我们就。来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，来了，